much. It is good to be back at uh, Capitol Baptist Church. Sandra, would you stand, please? I'd like for you to meet my wife. I've been here a couple times, but never with her. And this is my wife of the past uh, 55, going on 56 years. And I thank the Lord for her. And they say, I, I know my behavior is probably better when she's around. And, and uh, <laughs> she believes that my uh, illustrations and stories are more accurate, too, when she's around as well. So I, I don't know about that. But anyway, it's a blessing to have her. And thank you, Pastor, for the opportunity to, to uh, be back. We appreciate that very, very much. Um, I'm going to have you, we're going to be in Psalms uh, twice this morning, and uh, before I announce the uh, passage we're going to discuss, I'd like to say this about where we're going this morning in both this and the next service. Uh, Pastor just mentioned we had prayer a little bit ago, and he made uh, mention, asked me, he said, can you believe the things that we are seeing in this country and how fast uh, so many things have changed? And uh, I said to him that I am seeing things develop right now uh, before our eyes that I thought my son's generation would see, but I really didn't think that I would see. And things are moving really, really fast. And um, uh, the scripture says that in the last days perilous times shall come. And so there are always all kinds of ways to think about addressing uh, God's people in times like these and in troublesome times. And uh, I was thinking earlier this morning as I was meditating on where I was going today, I was thinking about the fact that every generation that I know has been through difficult and hard times. I mean, you, all you got to do is look back in history. And uh, I'm thinking about some of the struggles that... Uh, my uh, grandfather uh, went through some of the times. In fact, my great-grandfather, um, I was named after him. He was a preacher and a rancher and a farmer and a member of the second Oklahoma legislature in 1909 to 1911. Uh, he didn't run for re-election. He said, Oklahoma politics is no place for the man of God. Of course, that would be true in most states, I think. Yeah. But nonetheless... Um, I, I'm just looking back, and I'm thinking about the hard times of some of those uh, times. I'm thinking back into the uh, times uh, when my great-grandfather would have been a young man or born, and uh, the Civil War was uh, uh, a major event of that 19th century and troublesome times here in the United States of America. I, I uh, got a verse of a song uh, from Fanny Crosby, that uh, it's called an album of newly discovered songs and hymns of Fanny Crosby. And in one of those, she talked about the fact that the world is growing wild. And I thought, now, what could have been going on in Fanny Crosby's day? And I got to looking at the span of her lifetime. And when she would have been right in the prime of her life in writing songs, it would have been during the time of the Civil War. And then you look at the uh, World War I and the Spanish flu, my dad's mother uh, passed away when he was seven years old as a result of the Spanish flu. And so that was a widespread uh, pandemic uh, across the uh, land and the world, I guess. And so tough times, hard times there. My mom and dad got married in 1932. Now think about that. Uh, it's about the time of the Great Depression. And in our part of the world in the 1930s also was the, not only dealing with the Great Depression, but the Dust Bowl days. Uh, back then. And my wife's, I mean, sorry, my mother's uh, family, they all packed up. My mother and her sister, there were eight kids, they were already married, stayed in Oklahoma, but the rest of them went to California, wound up in Bakersfield, California. And uh, so the difficulties that I think about my parents going through, you know, and raising their children, uh, the uh, got married and started having children and had to deal with the with the uh, Great Depression and the Dust Bowl. And my dad was a farmer. And the Dust Bowl days were not good days for farmers, that's for sure. And so uh, I hear now about some of the struggles we're having in these <clears throat> unprecedented times. <laughs> unprecedented times. Well, maybe unprecedented in your generation, but certainly not unprecedented when we look at history. And somebody that says these are unprecedented times 
If they're just talking about the whole big scope of things, I, I suggest they wear a sign that says, I know nothing about history. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. Because that's the way it is. Now, here's the, here's the point I'm getting at. The point I'm getting at is there are all kinds of ways to address it. You can start talking about prophecy. You can start talking about, quote, what people call the signs of the times, unquote. And uh, that means that they believe there are uh, indications that we are living in the end time. I'll just say as far as uh, Jesus coming, uh, we're not looking for any signs forevermore. We're looking for the Savior. Amen. We're not sitting around saying, Is this, could this be a sign of his coming? Well, my soul, the Apostle Paul was looking for his coming right. and taught the people of his generation to look for it. So, so we could talk about the second coming, which is always appropriate. We could talk about a, a lot of different approaches. But when it all uh, comes down to uh, the basic, fundamental teaching of the Word of God, I'll tell you what we need to do. Focus on God. Amen. The same yesterday, Amen. today, right. and forever. Right. Immutability of God. The fact He never changes. He cannot change. He cannot deny Himself. He cannot be other than who and what He is. And uh, if, if the uh, message of the Bible, if there is an overall message of the Bible, and there definitely is, Amen. one of the clear messages of the Bible is don't lose sight of God right. and see God as He has revealed Himself. Now, all the time uh, over the years, I've, I've heard all kinds of things, knocking doors and talking to people in travel and on airplanes and all kinds of things. <laughs> And every once in a while, you'll, I've run across somebody that will say, well, you know, the way I always thought about God, and I learned, get ready to hear something really, I want to be nice, but this doesn't sound nice, dumb. Get ready to hear something really dumb. Because if we think that we can put these brains in gear and come remotely close to an appropriate thinking of God, that is ridiculous. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. The only thing we can know about God is the manner in which He has revealed Himself. And He has revealed Himself in creation. The Bible says so. Read Romans chapter 1. He has revealed Himself in creation. And He has revealed Himself in the person of His Son. And He has revealed Himself in this Word. And if our thinking about God is not commensurate, to the revelation that he has made of himself, then we are not going to think right about God. And if people don't think right about God, said A.W. Tozer, they won't live right before God. Right. Think about that one. If we do not think properly about God, then we will not live properly or die properly before God. That's two amens, but that's enough. I, I, I don't need any more. I, I know that's true. That's what this book teaches. Amen. amen. All right, so with that in mind, go to the 95th Psalm, if you would. The 95th Psalm. And then we're going to be back in another Psalm in the preaching hour. And uh, this morning, I just want to talk to you about uh, this Psalm that uh, is uh, it's a great blessing, great help to me. And uh, I used it, I remember opening many services as a pastor with uh, verse 1, O come, let us sing unto the Lord, let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before His presence with thanksgiving, and make a joyful noise unto Him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God, and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his. And he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Now let's pause right there. Stop here for just a moment or two. And then we're going to come back and do the rest of the song. But it, it begins with this. What we have read at the beginning is words <laughs> admonishing us to praise the Lord. Amen. Now there is a... Uh, mindset out here that praise and worship is a rather recent discovery in this country, uh, I guess in the world. 
And uh, there are those that uh, believe that if you're not doing praise and worship music, that you're really out of step and out of touch and you don't really know what's going on or how to praise the Lord. I remember knocking a door and uh, the, person, the lady said at the door, I told her where I was from and she kind of had this smirky smile on her face, not a pleasant smile like, hello, uh, not that, it was sort of like that kind of smile, you know. Kind of the eyes going back. And, and uh, so I knew she was thinking something as I was talking. And so she said, I know, I know of that church. That's the Songbook Church. <laughs> Southwest Baptist is the Songbook Church. I thought I'd never heard that before, that we were the Songbook Church. And so I kind of inquired. And she said, well, you all use songbooks. You don't do praise and worship. You do songbooks. <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> we don't do, no, you don't do praise music. You do songbooks, hymns. And uh, I felt like singing, praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed redeemer. But uh, uh, our blind piano player said when he heard me sing, he wishes he was deaf too. So I didn't <laughs> sing to her. But I did call to her attention the song that she also knew, praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed redeemer, how great thou art. Come on, we can just go on and on and on. Uh, the song that we just sang a moment ago, here's a congregation, is definitely to give praise to the Lord. There's no question about that. But they think they've discovered this praise and worship thing and don't know what it is. Well, here's what praise means. And this will help us move along faster in the next service as well. Because the word praise just simply means to shine a light upon. To shine. Well, what does that mean? Well, um, okay, if I start talking about my wife and I start mentioning the positive qualities and characteristics of my wife, I am shining the light on that in her life which is praiseworthy. And I have the Bible grounds to do that if you know about the Proverbs 31 woman. As her husband, I have the biblical right, uh, uh, right and uh, authority to give praise to my wife, which means I'm going to share some of the Qualities or characteristics that made, make her a good wife have made her a wonderful mother, a wonderful grandmother, a wonderful great-grandmother. How long is this going to go on? I mean, this is going to go on. And so there are all kinds of things I could say. I could tell you the kind of bus worker she was for 25 years of our uh, time in the ministry and on and on I could go. All right, so if I can shine uh, the light on some positive characteristics about her, what do you think it means to praise the Lord? Well, what it means is that we're going to expose or make known or give attention to and acknowledge the attributes of God that are praiseworthy. Amen. Now, here's the thing. Even in talking about my wife, I could talk about all kinds of positive qualities. Uh, uh, however, there are some things I'm not going to talk to you about uh, today. You mean she's not perfect? Uh, boy, very close, but since he's here, I'll just say it that way. Very, very <laughs> close. But like any other of Adam and Eve's descendants, there is always that other side where we say, however, you know. And so if we, I shouldn't have used her, I should have used somebody else. But if we're talking about, if I'm talking about, we were talking about a pastor, they said under Brother Johnny Pope. I mean, this guy is a preacher, deluxe, and he preaches everywhere. And uh, I don't know him that well, so I'm going to use him. But I'm going to say if we talk to his wife, we would probably think, oh, really? <laughs> is everybody with me here? Yeah, yeah. But there's nothing like that about God. Amen. When we talk about God and the qualities and the characteristics of God, there are no unfavorable uh, characteristics to point out. Amen. There are no howevers because he is God and therefore, in every aspect, in every way, he is worthy of our praise. Well, that's what he's talking about here when he said, Oh, come, I, I don't want to make too much of this, but I just want to say, when he says, Oh, come, you notice that he didn't just start and say, Come, let us sing unto the Lord. No, there is a sense of awe. There is a sense of urgency. There is a sense of sig 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 what is that word? <laughs> significance. There's a... Uh, there's a <laughs> Now, that's a cheap shot. I shouldn't have done that. I'm sorry. There's, a, there's a, a sense of significance here because he says, Oh, come and let us sing unto the Lord. So there's just a little more accentuation 
upon the subject isn't there when he says, Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. And what are you saying? This is something we ought to do. But he's not saying that. He's saying, Oh, this is something we ought to do. Is everybody with me here? And that's how the verse starts. He said, So, Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. And if you know about the Psalms, then you know that many of them were uh, Jewish songs. Many of them are still. And he says, O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Amen. So we have every right, every time that we assemble as a New Testament church, and I realize this is a psalm in the Old Testament, but we can talk about singing from the New Testament too, but every time we come, it is totally appropriate. Why do we get together every time, get the song back, and we sing? And we sing? Why do we do that? Right, right. right here. We're admonished to do that in the Word of God. Right. Oh, come, let us sing. And there are people, I'm, I'm afraid, there are people that may look at the song service as just something that we do till we get to the preaching, then they treat the preaching eventually about the same way. Right. Yeah. And this isn't just a religious motion that we go through. You go through the Bible and you'll see really, really clearly that God is not at all interested in religious activity and motion without heart. He has no interest in that. Right, right. And so he says, Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joy, watch this, joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Amen. Now, we could talk a long time, I'm sure, about verse number one, and when he's referred to as the rock of our salvation. Well, just kind of let your mind go. I mean, go back to the rock of ages, cleft for me, and, uh, and you go back to the book of Exodus, and you see that the Lord is our rock. And so it has everything to do with security, stability, it, it is sure. And so you and I know that Jesus Christ is that rock, that living stone, and that upon Him we stand and base our salvation. In other words, we're just talking about that which is sure. If you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, then you are saved. Well, yeah, but I've made some mistakes. Right, but that doesn't affect the position that you have Upon the rock. Right. It may affect, not only may, it does affect your fellowship with God, but it won't affect that you are established in Christ and your salvation is secure. It's called the rock of our salvation. Now, we ought to sing about that. Amen. And that's what the psalmist is saying. And then he said, uh, come before his presence with thanksgiving. How, how can we think, uh, I mean, if we're going to start our thinking about the Lord, we have to think about, he's my God, I know him. Amen. Because of Jesus Christ, because of salvation. Come, how can we talk about our salvation without a sense of gratitude? I don't think you can, genuinely and seriously. So i, I got to move through this, but let us come before His presence of thanksgiving. Make a joyful noise unto Him with psalms. Stop there just a second. There are some people that are against happy music. But he says here in two verses that we're to make a joyful noise. So when we go to church, uh, are there times for the slow? Are there times for the uh, maybe mild? Are there times to give utter reverence to God in music and song? Of course there is. Is there a time to express joy and happiness? Amen. So that somebody that's not a believer, they're an unlearned or an unbeliever that might come in the congregation, might realize hey, there's joy around here. Amen. Should they sense that? The, the fruit of the Spirit is love. What's that next one? Joy. Joy. If, I, I, I'm just telling you right now, somebody says, I know doctrine and I know Jesus and I know I'm saved. I'm just going to tell you right now, if you're really saved and you are walking in the Spirit, then joy is going to be a, 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 an evident part of your life. And the same thing ought to be true of a church body. There ought to be joy among the house of God that ought to be expressed by song as well as other ways. Now look down at verse number 3. So verse 1 and 2 has to do with the fact that the Lord ought to be praised. And verse number 3 and through 5 tell us why. He says, for the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. Now you notice that the gods at the end of verse number 3 is the little g. And so the gods of this world, little g gods, are a reference to the rulers of this world. And it's not like any of them are God. And every ruler in human history that has tried to present himself or has convinced himself that he is God has been greatly humbled right. by God. Right. 
Is everybody with me here? And uh, that's evident. I don't have time to go into all that, but I'm just saying. For the Lord is a great God, and he is a great king above all gods. And all God's people said? Amen. So what does he say about the fact that he is a great God? Well, it, it, when he mentions God here, the term by which he mentions God is a stronger reference to his might, his greatness, his power, Amen. his might. And so uh, uh, that being said, when we go to verse number four, he talks about the matters of creation. And he said, in his hand are the deep places of the earth. Stop right there, just a second. Uh, the wife and I have a daughter whose husband pastors out in the panhandle of Texas. I don't know how many have been out in the uh, panhandle of Texas and down the western part of Texas. But there is uh, one of the largest aquifers, is that, the, is that the way you pronounce it? After making fun of our brother here, I'm sure I'm going to foul up some words here today. But anyway, uh, aquifer, is that what they call it? Where underground water. And uh, it's one of the largest. And my son-in-law, where they live in uh, near Amarillo, Texas, the rainfall average there is very minimal. It's dry much of the time. And he said, you know, in all these years that he's lived there, 21 years now, he said, in all these years, we've never had, we've had drought, but we've never had water rationing. There's not even a mention, don't wash your car, don't water the yard, don't do this, don't do that. It's because they live, and that whole section lives over one of the largest, if not the largest, aquifer in the world, so they get their water from underground. And... Uh, then he started talking about some things he did, uh, kind of researching about this thing, and there are places of it, they have no way to measure how deep it is, how vast it is. And uh, the levels go down, but what's amazing is they come back up. And it's like a mystery there, and as are many uh, aquifers in the, in the world, the underground water. And so we look at that, and the more he talked about it, having read about it and talked about it, the more he talked about it, the more amazing the thing becomes. And then I read in my Bible and I say, uh, I see that in his hand are the deep places of the earth. And all that is under the earth, uh, under the ground to us, all, all of that that is under the earth, under the ground, uh, all of those deep places, plus all the reserves. I, I know where I am here in Delaware, and I shouldn't be talking about uh, fossil stuff under the ground. <laughs> Uh, it's destroying the climate. But anyway, uh, but, uh, I know I shouldn't, but still, it's an amazing thing. I said, still, it's, it is an utterly amazing thing. And how many resources are under the ground? And so we look at those things and we marvel, and he says, the deep places of the earth are in his hand. This is all God. Well, it's amazing what nature has done. I beg your pardon. It's amazing what God Amen. has done. Amen. See, I know I need to keep moving here. Look here. He said, in his hand are the deep places of the earth. Look at the next line. The strength of the hills is his also. Look at the mountains. Look at the hills. I've been blessed to you know, be all over the country, and like many of you perhaps. And I, uh, My favorite mountain state used to be Colorado. Now it's Montana. Oh, man, it's incredible. The massive mountains and the big, there are those that are peaks and so forth, and there are those that are big, rolling mountains and hills. And, and uh, I don't know, I love driving across this country. I, I don't really enjoy flying, but I do enjoy driving. Looking across, the, uh, across this land, you look at the mountains and you look at the hills, and you just marvel at the beauty and the magnificence of it all. And the mountains do look strong. You drive across eastern Colorado from western Kansas, and it's just so very, very flat. And then in the distance, you can see the mountains, and the closer you get, uh, the bigger they look and the more magnificent they are. And you drive through them, and it's just an awesome thing. I, I'm telling you, it's just an amazing thing. The strength of the hills. Uh, yes, it's amazing what nature has done. I beg your pardon. God made those hills. God made those mountains. Yeah. It's all His. Amen. The sea is His. Right. Yeah. The body of water, what is it? Is it two-thirds of the earth is covered by water? 
I guess I'm going to talk about it. I should find out. I, but I'm asking, isn't that something, right? About two-thirds of the uh, coverage of the earth is water? And I remember our first trip overseas uh, when we went to Australia. You know how long you fly over water? <laughs> Going about five to 600 miles an hour? Yeah. Hours and hours and hours. I think it was 13, but it seemed like six days. You know, I mean, it's just <laughs> on and on over water. And every once in a while, you can look out of the, those in the early days of my flying. I'd look out the plane and think, what am I doing here? <laughs> this is amazing. It is. It's meant to, we're supposed to be amazed at it. Amen. It's a marvelous thing to see he made it. His hands formed the dry land. Amen. I think Mother Nature gets a lot more credit than Mother Nature should get. Why don't we, if we know how it came into existence, why don't we give the one credit that brought it into existence? Amen. This is the work of God. It's the work of his hands. So that's all that's praiseworthy there that the psalmist mentions. But then there's a division. Look in verse number 6. Here we go again. Oh, come. Is there a time to stand and sing and praise the Lord with a joyful sound and thanksgiving? Is there a time for that? Yes. But there's a time for something else that seems to be rather foreign to many of God's people and even confusing where he says, Oh, come, let us worship Stop. Stop. Just a second. Now, I, I, see, I don't know how it's spoken around here, so I, I'm not trying to step on anybody's territory or anything. I'm just trying to be faithful to the Word of God. Amen. But I can just tell you this. At home, we don't say, let's stand together and worship the Lord. Well, you can stand together and sing and praise the Lord, but you don't stand to worship the Lord. Now, don't forget, we worship God with our tithes and offerings. I don't see people doing that. Well, you're a pastor. You haven't seen people giving tithes and offerings? Right. But I never saw anybody do what worship is when they gave their offering. I'm not trying to cause problems. Don't look at me like I'm a troublemaker. I'm just trying to be faithful to the Word of God. Look what he says. Oh, come, let us worship. Well, I'm not sure exactly then what that means. Keep reading. And bow down. Amen. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Amen. Now, if I can have your attention here just a second, there are many people out here, and I've visited them and talked to them. I mean, they, and, and some are in pulpits. And they kind of say, well, to me, worship means, well, do you want me to say, to me, baptism means, or do we care anything about what baptism does mean? What is baptism? Don't we understand in relation to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but what about the mode? Take a bowl of water and splash somebody? I baptize you. Well, just because some dude said that he baptized him doesn't mean it's baptism. Because the word has a definition. And most of you know it. And it has to do with immersion. So we're not left with the liberty just to take the Word of God and start making up our own definitions and making it mean whatever we want it to mean. Right. Well, do you realize we're living in the 21st century and there is such a thing as my truth? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Such a thing as my truth. If you want to talk about sports, if you want to talk about the entertainment world, if you want to talk about stuff that doesn't matter a hill of beans, go ahead and talk about your truth. But when we're talking about God and the revelation that he has made, then nobody is licensed to, to come up with their truth. See? So what does worship mean? Exactly what it means. You know what the word means? To get low. To get down. To humble one's self. Part of the definition, technically, part of the definition has to do with having the wind knocked out of you. Did you ever have somebody that was flying high, like maybe in a sporting event or some other kind of thing, and they're flying high, and all of a sudden it, there's a reversal, and you say, boy, they got the wind knocked out of them. Is that, that's part of this word. And so, no matter, look at me a second, no matter how we esteem ourselves, when we come in relation to 
God is supposed to knock the wind out of us. It's supposed to humble us. That's why a great prophet by the name of Isaiah said that when he saw the Lord high and lifted up, Amen. that he said, uh, woe is me, as he humbled himself before God. So the definition of worship is not stand or not put your offering in the offering plate. That is not worship. Right. Right. To worship means to kneel and to bow down, just like he says. I had somebody uh, contend with me some time ago, and they said, well, I got a, uh, right here in the book of Nehemiah, chapter number 8, uh, that after their, and 9, that after they read the law of God, that there was weeping and tears, and they stood and went to their tent door and worshiped the Lord. So see, it's right here, they're standing to worship the Lord. No, not really, not if they worship, because standing is not a part of the definition. Well, what does it say they stood? Well, if they were sitting, as they may have been, I sit down in my house some. Does anybody else ever sit down at home besides some mothers of seven or nine children? You know, they may never sit down. But the rest of us, we sit down at home, don't we? I can't wait to get home and sit down. I got my favorite chair and everything. So if I'm going to go in my office where I do my prayer time and worship the Lord, I don't sit in my rocking chair, uh, 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 recliner. I don't sit there. I get up and go there and worship, which means that's where I get down. Amen. That's what it always means in the Bible. Amen. It's the definition of the word. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, Amen. our maker. For he is a great God. That's what the scripture says. He is a great God. Amen. For the, uh, look, look in verse number, uh, verse number seven. He is, uh, verse number uh, three up there said, great God and a great king above all gods. And in verse number seven, he is our God. This is a personal thing. Amen. Excuse me. Is God your God? Amen. What does he say? Well, oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God. This is personal. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Can I have your attention here just a second? Pastor, you, you, you've been, you at the Church Finders Conference. Did you come to Southwest when you was there? Yeah. Okay. So at Southwest Baptist Church, there's the, uh, the floor, ground floor, and then there's a horseshoe balcony. means it goes around the back and the both sides. I, I've thought about uh, worship this way. What if we would... Uh, put that uh, kind of plexiglass up to seal off the balcony. And let's say it's the kind of glass that the people that are behind it in the balcony could see down on the congregational floor, but the people on the floor couldn't see them. Okay, so let's say that we blocked off the balcony and we brought in people that don't know God, don't know the Bible, couldn't find the book of Genesis if they had to, and, and we bring them in there. They are unlearned. They are not believers. They know nothing. Okay? So we set them behind that plexiglass and ask them to observe the service. After they have observed the service, we give them a piece of paper with a definition of worship on it. To kneel, to bow down, to come low. To get prostrate. <laughs> okay. And then we ask the people, did you observe the service? Yes. What did you observe? Well, we noticed they stood to sing. We noticed they passed an offering plate. We know, or they passed around and people were putting something in it, money and stuff. And we noticed that. And we noticed that the people sat and this guy went on for hours up there, and he went on. And so we, we noticed all that. We look at where, how many people worshiped. Well, at the end, there were two or three people that went up there by the stage, and yeah, they got down. They put their face down. But near as I could tell, that's about it. We call it the worship service. 
and people that all they know is the definition of it said, well, I saw three or four, and I didn't see anybody else worshiping. Huh. I have a question. You see a problem with that? If we're, I mean, if we're going to have public worship, probably we ought to have worship. Because it means what it means. And we're not at liberty to make it mean what we want it to mean. And you know what I find many people are averse to? An invitation. They're not interested. I can do what I need to do at the pew. You can. Or set it at your chair. You, you, uh, you can. But when God really meets with us, is there never a time you feel driven to the ground? Is there never a time you feel a need to bow? And kneel before God in response to the fact that He mercifully and graciously will speak to us. Jesus. We hear His word. We are convicted by the working of the Holy Spirit in our soul. Amen. And we passively respond as if it's good. I'm not going to go down there and bow down. I wonder what heading that would come under. What kind of a heading would we give that? A person does not want anybody to see them bowed down. I wonder what would be a good word for that. What's that? Pride. Pride. I think that's a big issue, a big problem. Because what he is talking about here is just the opposite of pride. And as you read through the Word of God, whether it is Isaiah that I mentioned, or whether it is Peter or Nathaniel or Thomas when he saw the scars in his hand or John on the Isle of Patmos. When, ladies and gentlemen, when there is a, an awareness of the presence of and meeting with God, Amen. there is a willingness to humble oneself and bow before him. And I submit to you that there are people in Baptist churches, I'm, that's all I'm going to talk about, people in Baptist churches all across America that are willing to stand and praise the Lord and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms and with songs and with singing that you'll never see them bow and worship. No matter how strong the service is, no matter how convicting the message was, or no matter how high we were lifted by some glorious truth, the more He blesses our heart with truth and speaks Amen. to us, the more humbling it is and should put us on our face. Amen. And there might be people here that say, well, talk on. I have my own time of worship. I hope you do. I hope you do. Not many people I talk to do. I'm not accusing anybody. I'm just saying I hardly talk with anybody that includes true prostrating oneself before God as a part of their worship to the Lord or kneeling and bowing before the Lord. And you know why they don't? It's a heart issue. And verse number, I don't have time to really dig into it, but right here in verse number 7, look at this. Today if you will hear his voice, Harden not your heart. Don't be like the Israelites in the time of provocation, time of temptation in the wilderness when their fathers tempted and proved and saw my work. I was grieved with this generation. They do err in their heart. They have not known. You know why they don't worship and bow down before God and humble themselves? Because their heart is amiss and they do not know his ways. And God said, I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Why did a whole generation die in the wilderness and never get to go into the land of rest? The land of Canaan? Why? Because of that hardness of heart right there. And there are many people, many people that wonder, why isn't God more real? Why is it I don't have more peace? Why is it my Christian life isn't full and running over? Could be a heart problem. Could be a heart problem. Amen. I said, 
It could, boy, I'd feel like a fool going down there. People go to ball games, don't care if they look like a fool. People do all kinds of things in celebration or times of grief and don't worry about it. We're talking about you and me and God. Amen. Praise the Lord. I, I, I challenge you. Second bell's rung, I'm done. But I challenge you, look into this. Yeah. Look into it some more. Amen. I've made it my business to memorize this uh, psalm. It's such a help to my own heart and puts me before God, uh, kneeling before Him daily. Amen. Daily. You don't have to wait on Sunday to worship God. Somebody help me, please. You don't have to wait on Sunday. Consider these things, and we'll continue on with another psalm the next service. Pastor, if you'd go.